Be listening this Sunday from 7 p.m. for a rebroadcast of the Business Forum. Our guest, Mr. Ransford Smith, the Deputy Secretary General at the Commonwealth Secretariat in London. That's a rebroadcast of the Business Forum this Sunday at 7 p.m. Compliments Venture Capital Incentive Program. Exclusively on Power 102.1 FM. The Venture Capital Incentive Program provides entrepreneurs with an exciting vehicle for conversion of sound ideas into financially viable business enterprises. So do you have good business ideas or an existing business? Then contact us at 624-3068, 624-3079 or 624-3081 or visit our website at www.vcip.org. All right, then, of course, it's time for the business round. Of course, this is about what a 2.1 FM, and we are pleased, as always, to have uh, Sandrine Rattan with us. She's, of course, she's a communication specialist. Sandrine, good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, Sir Charles. Good afternoon, Trinidad and Tobago, and to our listeners on the World Wide Web. Special greetings to our international counterparts at the Commonwealth Secretariat in London. Recently, I had as my guest Mr. Eduardo Del Bue who is Director of Communications and Public Affairs at the Commonwealth Secretariat. And he provided us with an overall insight into the operations and functions of the Secretariat. And as we're all aware, Trinidad and Tobago hosted the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting from November 27th to 29th, 2009. This afternoon, we continue our discussions on the activities of the Secretariat but with a major focus on economic affairs and also some discussions on the issue of climate change, which was a main topic on the table at Chogham 2009. And my guest is Mr. Ransford Smith, Deputy Secretary General at the Commonwealth Secretariat in London. But before joining Mr. Smith online, I'll now briefly share his profile with you. Ransford Smith was appointed Deputy Secretary General of the Commonwealth in August 2006. A career diplomat of nearly 30 years standing in the Jamaican public and foreign service, Mr. Smith previously served as permanent secretary to the Ministry of Industry and Investment. His diplomatic career has included postings at the Jamaican Embassy in Washington, D.C., as well as the Jamaican Mission to the United Nations in New York. Mr. Smith is the first Jamaican to serve as a Commonwealth Deputy Secretary General. He was formerly the permanent representative of Jamaica, to the Office of the United Nations and its specialized agencies in Geneva, Rome, and Vienna. He was also Ambassador of Jamaica to the World Trade Organization and served as an ambassador to a number of European countries. He has extensive experience of participation in multilateral economic and development bodies. So we go straight online to Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith, welcome to the Business Forum. You're live on Power 102 FM in Trinidad. Uh, Good afternoon, and thank you very much for having me. You're welcome. Mrs. Smith, given the current global economic climate, what are some of the key initiatives being undertaken by the Commonwealth Secretariat to assist member nations, particularly those in the Caribbean, which may have been severely affected in terms of high levels of unemployment and perhaps inflation? Hi. Uh, thank you for asking that. Let me preface my response by noting that the community adopted by the heads in Port of Spain earlier this week, in fact, uh, cites the impact of the global recession on Commonwealth countries. And our own analytical work in the Secretariat has showed that more than half of the 53 members of the Commonwealth will experience zero growth or no or very limited growth in 2009. And why is this so? It is because of the composition of the Commonwealth. Fully 32 of our members are small states. Another eight members are also least developed countries, and if we include Rwanda, the latest member, we have 41 Commonwealth members or 53 members that are either small states or least developed countries. And uh, a characteristic of these economies is that they are small and open economies. What has happened in the current crisis is that the transmission mechanisms have all been directly related to these 
countries and their economic structure, the transmission mechanisms of trade, of investment, of remittances, of earnings from tourism, for example, have all been areas of particular interest and relevance to these countries. And so they have suffered a disproportionate impact yes. uh, as a result in the current crisis, which they themselves had nothing at all to do as uh, with, with causing. Yes. Uh, what can the Commonwealth Secretariat do? Uh, I, I have to emphasize that, of course, we are not a loan or a grant providing entity. We provide technical assistance and capacity building to members through the Commonwealth Fund for Technical Cooperation. So, in fact, our primary mode of response has been advocacy, and we have been relentless in bringing to the attention of the international community the particular plight of these countries, particularly the small island developing states and the small states that have been saddled with, that are saddled with quite high levels of debt, and this is particularly characteristic of the Caribbean. Yes. And indeed, we have, we believe that the international community is increasingly aware of this unique situation. Our finance ministers we met in Cyprus just in, uh, in October, before we came to Shogun, drew attention themselves and cited the need for responses from the global community to this particular situation, and the heads have also done so. We at the Secretariat are prepared to go forward with making proposals that can address the key issues such as access to finance, yes. high levels of debt of these small island heavily indebted states. And uh, we will, of course, be doing so. Let me just note that these countries did not have not benefited from any of the debt relief initiatives that have been in place. The HIPIC, the highly, the high poorly indebted countries, and the multilateral debt relief initiative, which provided significant debt relief, perhaps as much as 120 billion totally for a number of countries. Of the 40 countries that benefited, that have benefited from these initiatives, only 10 are Commonwealth countries, and indeed only one is a member of CARICOM, Guyana. So I make this point just to emphasize that these countries have not in the past been the beneficiaries of the initiatives taken by the international community, and we are drawing this attention, emphasizing that the current, the current crisis, crisis exacerbates their situation, and indeed calling for, for action. Yes. Later, Mr. Smith, I want us to speak a bit more on the issue of advocacy, particularly in the context of negotiations with the, some, some of the key international agencies. But tell me, the, econ the Economic Affairs Division of the Secretariat is responsible for organizing the annual Commonwealth Finance Minister's meeting. I know you mentioned it in your preamble, with, which treats primarily with the issue of consensus and capacity building for developing countries. But could you expand on this for us and perhaps speak a bit about some of the other expected outcomes from the Finance Minister's meetings? Well, may I say that, you know, consensus building is one of the goals of the Commonwealth, uh, that we do this on a number of fronts, including through the finance minister's meeting, but we also do this, of course, through our other ministerial meetings. The finance minister's meeting is held annually, and the last meeting was in Cyprus at the end of September. I think it was the 30th of September to the 2nd of October. Uh, the minister's discuss the situation of the global economy, as you would well expect. They discuss the special, this particular situation of small states, some of which I have just uh, indicated in my earlier response. Yes. There were, of course, other issues on their agenda, the debt burden of these states, access to finance, access, the limited access to financing, especially in the current crisis, when we have seen uh, the in fact, the debt rating of some of these countries, in fact, has been reduced, which, which increases their debt servicing costs. Yes. The ministers discussed the matter of international financial centers, which had come to the fore, and, of course, the voice and 
governance in the international financial institutions. Other issues were of importance to them, aid effectiveness. These are perhaps standard issues on their agenda, improving, improving and increasing aid effectiveness, uh, addressing gender-responsive budgeting, which is the effort by countries to ensure that their budgets, both in terms of the collection and the expenditure, uh, are gender sensitive. And also, discussed was public financial management. The Secretariat has a public financial management tool which members utilize, and the effort is to increase the efficiency and transparency in public financial management. These were some of the issues that were discussed. Debt sustainability as well. Uh, because uh, one of the issues that now confront states that have had benefited from debt relief is that they must ensure that they do not retrogress into a situation where their debt, debt that they take on becomes, which is a stage where, where it becomes unsustainable. Yes. So the question is, is not only to get debt relief, but to maintain a situation where you are not excessively burdened by new debt. When you are debt-free, lenders tend to proliferate. Yes. Uh, so those are some of the issues that finance ministers discussed. One of the decisions that was taken was that we will have an experimental period between 2.10 and 2.12 when we will hold the finance ministers meeting, not in a host country as was the case. The last one was in Cyprus, the one before in St. Lucia. Yes. But we will hold the finance minister's meeting at the venue of the annual IMF World Bank. And this is an effort to uh, seek to ensure that this meeting of finance ministers uh, exerts some influence yes. on the meeting of the meet, annual meeting of the World Bank and the IMF. And perhaps a related point also, also discussed was how the G20 members of the Commonwealth can play a more instrumental role in bringing to attention the concerns of Commonwealth countries at, in fora, such as the G20 meetings and also, of course, the IMF World Bank meeting. Excellent. Mr. Smith, please hold your thoughts. Hold the line while we take a short break. When we return, we will discuss a bit about international trade. The Venture Capital Incentive Program provides entrepreneurs with an exciting vehicle for conversion of sound ideas into financially viable business enterprises. So do you have good business ideas or an existing business? Then contact us at 624-3068, 624-3079, or 624-3081, or visit our website at www.vcip.org. Welcome, welcome back to the Business Forum. If you're just joining us, my guest is Mr. Ransford Smith, Deputy Secretary General at the Commonwealth Secretariat in London. Mr. Smith, welcome back. Thank you very much. Mr. Smith, I'm aware that the issue of international trade is a priority item for the Secretariat. And against this background, the Secretariat works closely with member countries on strengthening their capacities to deal with regional and multilateral trade negotiations to effectively develop economic partnership agreements, for example. What is the main process used in treating with this activity? I know you spoke a bit earlier, but if you could expand some more for us, please. Yes, the, 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 the main project is the hub and spokes project in terms of capacity building. Also, of course, in the area of international trade, as in other areas, we also do research and analysis, and we do consensus building. Uh, but the capacity building aspect is primarily carried out through the Hub and Spokes project, and this is a project that we engage in with the, in partnership with the European Union, and it's a 20 million euro project of which the European Union funds about two-thirds from the Secretariat, the remainder. Another partner is the organization International Francophonie, which is the OIF, which uh, is part space in the Hub and Spokes project in relation to French-speaking African countries of the ACP. Uh, we deploy uh, about 30 regional trade advisors 
and trade advice and trade policy advisors throughout the ACP region. And uh, the regional trade advisors uh, are the senior, senior, the senior amongst the two groupings. The, the trade policy advisors uh, tend to be stationed in ministries. The regional trade policy advisors in regional bodies. In the CARICOM, and we have we have advisors stationed in the CARICOM Secretariat and the OECS Secretariat, and a number of analysts in various care forum member countries, about eight, I think, at this time. Yes. We undertake trade policy analysis and formulation, for trade policy formulation and support for members in the negotiations, both the Doha trade negotiations as well as, of course, the EPA negotiations. This has proven very successful. All the evaluations we have done, we have concluded that this that the project is indeed a very important one, and members have found it quite, quite, quite useful, including in this in this region. I must, I must emphasize, yes. uh, the project is uh, now will 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 come to a conclusion in 2010. But we are actually engaged in consultations currently to design and develop a successor to to the project. Yes. And indeed, I think last week we had consultations in Barbados uh, with stakeholders and interested parties in seeking to do that. And we have developed a project design for the second phase. We will, of course, be seeking to secure funding from regional groupings, uh, from what we will also provide funding ourselves and from other parties. So we fully intend that the project will continue, and we see the project indeed perhaps making a transition, if only gradually, from assisting in negotiations to assisting in the implementation of outcomes in terms of the deployment of experts to help countries. After all, there's little point in negotiating without being able to fully take advantage of outcomes. Yes. So that is the evolution that we would see in this very useful project. Excellent. The issue of climate change, Mrs. Smith, dominated the discussions at the Commonwealth Summit held recently. But before articulating on this, I'd like us to speak quickly on the Kyoto Protocol, which is an amendment to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and is intended in part to bring countries together to reduce global warming. Could you share with our listeners briefly the genesis of this particular document? Okay, fine. Uh, very, very briefly, uh, the, you, you, I think you mentioned the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, Correct. which entered into force in 1994. Yes. Uh, the principal operational vehicle, so to speak, of the UNFCCC is the Kyoto Protocol. Yes. And the protocol sets binding targets for 37 industrialized countries and the European Union as a collective unit, that is the European Union, uh, to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions over a five-year period, 2008-2012, to levels, that is to reduce these emissions to levels on average about 5% below those of 1990. It's of course called the Kyoto Protocol because it was adopted in Kyoto, Japan. Yes. in December 1997, yes. and it entered into force in February 2005. Well, more than 180, in fact, 184, I think, parties of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change have ratified the protocol. Uh, perhaps uh, 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 a conspicuous commission was the United States, which signed, but never ratified. Thus, the United States never committed itself to the reduction obligations. Uh, the, perhaps in a nutshell, while the Framework Convention merely encourages industrialized countries to stabilize their greenhouse gas emissions, the protocol legally commits them to do so. The discussions that have been on the way uh, in recent times have been to pursue a commitment target for the 
a second period, second commitment period in regard to the protocol. I think that basically is, in a nutshell, there are some uh, perhaps mechanisms related to the protocol. Two, two, two that might be worthy of mention would be the emissions trading, yes. which has led to the creation of a so-called carbon market. Yes. Basically, this mechanism that this vehicle allows countries that have received but not used emission credits to trade them with other countries. That, and there's another mechanism, which is the clean development mechanism, which allows countries that undertake, that are committed to undertaking emission reduction to carry out projects in developing countries nice. that, that, and to receive credits, green projects, so to speak, and to receive credits that can be counted towards meeting their national Kyoto targets. Those are two of the mechanisms. There's a third, which I perhaps will just mention, a certified emission reduction credit, which is somewhat complex. But that is, in an essence, is the, is the, is the, the in a nutshell, is what the, the Kyoto Protocol is. Okay, and this is. leads me to uh -huh. the Climate Change Summit in Copenhagen, scheduled for December 7th to the 18th, where 65 world leaders are expected to attend. And according, Mr. Smith, to the Commonwealth Climate Change Declaration, a global climate change solution is central to the survival of peoples among other expected key de deliverables. But based on your earlier articulation, what level of collective conscience do you, is anticipated when these leaders gather in Copenhagen? And I, I, if, if you'll permit me just to comment on that whole notion of survival, I mean, the, the Commonwealth, as we indicated, earlier comprises at least 41 small states and LDs, least developed countries. The UN some years ago identified these two groups as being the countries that were most at risk, most at risk in relation to the consequences of climate change, of course, most at risk because they had the least capacity yes. to respond. I'd really like to make that point. And most small island states are either very low-lying, uh, not exceeding three or four meters above sea level, or their habitable land is heavily concentrated in coastal areas. And because of this, uh, any sea rise uh, beyond perhaps a meter or so is likely to render, you know, entire islands, for example, in the Pacific, uninhabitable. So that it is indeed a literal construction to speak of uh, states facing a survival challenge because of because of climate change. Uh, the COP two conference, which is the the, or the the Copenhagen conference, which is which is forthcoming, uh, we well the 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 we have adopted, of course, uh, a declaration at, in Port of Spain, and it has a number of important elements. It Cites the needs of the most vulnerable countries, which is which is very important. It also speaks to the importance of a legally binding agreement and uh, pledges to a comprehensive and substantial operational binding agreement in Copenhagen, leading towards a full full legally binding outcome no later than 2010. Yes. Uh, that is the second element, and the third element is, of course, that it commits to fast track fast staff fast part funding for adapt adaptation and indeed to a specific figure of $10 billion annually by 2012 and indeed to a dedicated percentage of that 10% to go to small island states. Uh, I think those are very, those are very important elements. Uh, what what will the outcome in Copenhagen be? We have seen an emerging, cons an emerging a strong emerging view around the notion that there there will be at Copenhagen uh, a operationally an, an operation an, an operational agreement that can then lay the basis for a legal binding agreement outcome in 2010. Okay. It is fair to say that uh, 
a number of significant groups within the climate change negotiations have been advocating uh, a legally binding outcome at Copenhagen. Okay. That is to say a commitment to targets, reduction targets by developed countries at Copenhagen. And of course, the second track of the, of the negotiations has been a discussion of a long-term cooperation, which would, could lead to a emission target in the longer term, uh, up to 2050, for example. Uh, despite this, this, this articulation by a number of, of groupings within the climate change negotiations, uh, what has been evolving is a sense that a, long, a binding agreement at Copenhagen in terms of a legally binding outcome may not be possible. And uh, there has been uh, increasingly discussion of a position of a situation where Copenhagen would become, as it were, a important staging post to a final agreement the following year. Okay. And the and the heads of government statement in Port of Spain re reflects reflects this perhaps more pragmatic position at this time. Okay, okay, Mr. Smith. There is a lot more that we can chat about with regards to the climate change issue. But after the conference in Copenhagen, we will definitely have a follow-up interview. But before you leave, if you could um, give some closing thoughts. Well, uh, simply to say that the conference, uh, the, the head of government conference in, in Port of Spain, is actually the second one that I attended. I attended Kampal and this one, and I must say that it was indeed a conference that was, uh, it, it, achieved, it achieved a great deal. Uh, one, one must say that we, we have heard indeed media speculation in some quarters about the relevance of the Commonwealth, but certainly I thought that the Port of Spain conference was, a, was an answer to that, both in terms of the attendance, in terms of the quality of the discussions, and in terms of the quality of the outcomes. I think it demonstrated quite clearly that the Commonwealth, as an association of member states, has a, continues to have a very useful role to play. Like any association, like any entity, it is evolving. It is not the Commonwealth of 60 years ago. It has evolved. And uh, I think that that evolution is indeed one that is commendable. And Port of Spain demonstrated that, certainly in my view. Excellent. Mr. Smith, it was indeed a pleasure having you as my guest on the Business Forum today. And uh, we will keep in touch with you and follow the... the um, deliberations on the climate change debate. So Certainly thank you. My, for pleasure, thank my you. pleasure to have been with you and just to emphasize that this, all of this is very important to the Caribbean in particular. Thank Hope you. And beyond. Okay. Thank you. There you have it, listeners. Mr. Ransford Smith as our guest this evening, Deputy Secretary General of the Commonwealth Secretary at in London, sharing with us quite a bit in terms of the economic affairs of the Secretariat as well as articulating a lot on climate change which is an issue we will follow thank you for listening until next time the venture capital incentive program provides entrepreneurs with an exciting vehicle for conversion of sound ideas into financially viable business enterprises so do you have good business ideas or an existing business then contact us at 624-3068 624-3079 or 624-3081 or visit our website at www.vcip.org